Good Thursday afternoon, Jeff. Four o'clock time for Sports for CLE. Hope you're having a good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Well, today was the day the Browns uh, have restructured Nick Chubb's contract for 2024, significantly lowering his uh, base to 11.75 million. What he costs against the cap is even less than that. Um, now he does have incentives back um, in his deal that he can earn the money back. Um, some of the money, most of the money back um, that he agreed to negotiate down. That coming from Mary Kay Cabot, multiple sources as well. Let's welcome in Quincy Carrier, Untitled, Unfiltered Browns coverage. Quincy, this was always going to be the outcome. We, the, Andrew Barry told you he was going to do that. Um, they were never going to cut Nick Chubb. That's just not how this front office rolls. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when the first press conference of the year happens and he's talking 10 minutes about how much he loves Nick Chubb and how important Nick Chubb is to what they're doing, that just doesn't sound like the type of player you want to cut when you're trying to make a championship run. Uh, they were never going to cut Nick Chubb. I don't think Nick Chubb was interested in playing anywhere else. I don't think the Browns are interested in Nick Chubb playing anywhere else. I think they both wanted to make this happen. They both understood the reality of his injury and that there was going to have to be kind of a, a contract re a renegotiation or restructure here they came to terms with it and, and it, we talked about this before this is stuff we kind of knew the browns were going to do the second the offseason started the only reason it's kind of surprising to some now is because it got relitigated <laughs> in between the time that we knew it and when it happened they were a little busy in free agents free agency and all that you know the interesting thing is that we haven't heard anything about the extensions i imagine that's going to have to be on the back burner until the draft the extensions for andrew barry kevin Stefanski. all right uh, another topic um, deshaun watson um the national narrative on that if you will LaShawn mccoy uh, from fs1 speak is this a make or break season uh, for deshaun watson I think it's a make or break year for him. You said he was five, six, five and one when he's playing, so yep. that's pretty really good. So you look at his numbers, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Average 185 yards passing. Yep. That was ranked 31st. Yeah. It's only it 32 teams. Mm. Okay, so that's the total yards because he, mm. he can scramble too, right? Average 210 yards. Mm. That's ranked 25th. Mm. That's not a good. Eight touchdowns. Mm. That's ranked 24th. Mm. I guess that's okay. Mm. Six turnovers, two um, two pick sixes, <laughs> and a fumble recovery for a touchdown. So mm -hmm. I mean. We can look at the wins in 5-1 and one and say that, but when we're really watching play, I watched a guy like Joe Flacco, right, who I never thought he was super great like that. I thought he was a good quarterback, right? He had his good moments, right? Overall, was just above average. Is that safe to say? Or, mm -hmm. right? He looked better than Deshaun Watson. He came off the couch. Mm -hmm. And he's almost 40. I don't know. I might make that up, but he's old. <laughs> so when I watched Deshaun, Deshaun Watson, I need to see some because I'm tired of um, defending him. Sure. Yeah. I know how good he used to be. I haven't seen nothing look close. So if he don't ball this year, it could be a break year. You know, LaShawn McCoy knows it's not fantasy football. It's not about the numbers. It, it's, it's about winning and losing. I, the other thing is he hasn't played consistently enough. It's been in one game, out two games, in, in for some games, out for some games. He's got to get back on the field. But the bottom line is... He's 8-4 and four in games that he started and finished. That's trending towards a playoff team. That's, that's, if you're 8-4 and four after 12 games, you're going to be in position to win the AFC North. Yeah, the, I, I, I struggle to understand why people who actually look at this are making this Brown season about the performance of Deshaun Watson one way or the other. One thing that Deshaun Watson has proven since coming back is that he's not going to stand in the way of the team's ability to win. You can debate about how good he's been, if he's been good, if he's been bad, whatever you want. But one thing you cannot debate is that he has not been somebody or a quarterback that has stopped a team from winning games. They're eight and four with them on the field. You could say seven and four if you don't want to count the Indianapolis game. Still a record that you would be happy with over that amount of games. But like we're we're really leaving out this possibility that Deshaun Watson could play well. He doesn't have to play great for this team to be good. Like, what is the take if the team is an 11-12 win team and his numbers aren't spectacular? And 
how much does it matter if his numbers are spectacular? Brock Purdy's numbers aren't spectacular. They get to the Super Bowl. That's fine. Patrick Mahomes' numbers last year weren't spectacular, but he was able to hit the haymakers when he needed to hit the haymakers. We make so much out of bulk production but it really does matter when a thing happens. Like you could talk about how many yards Deshaun Watson threw in that Baltimore game. What I know is that the two drives the Browns needed it most, he came through. You could talk about the lack of production in any of the other games that he's played, how he didn't break 300 yards, but when the Browns needed scores in those games that they won, he came up with those scores. That's ultimately what matters. You cannot read football. You got to watch it. And that's because some of this production comes in context that's important. And that's the one thing I think people miss when they just try to divide out, oh, he had this many yards in this many games. That's where this ranks. But if you watch him, if you watch when that production happens, you would know that it's a similar situation to any quarterback who might not be putting up great numbers, but is playing well enough for the team to win, where he's doing the things where it matters. Um, Obviously, the game against Pittsburgh is bad. He had a horrible game that one. But outside of that, and maybe his first game back against the Texans, I can't really point at many bad games he's had as a Cleveland Brown. He just hasn't had one of those crazy games yet, which is fair because he hasn't even played 17 full games with the Cleveland Browns. So, I mean, like, if he stays healthy last year, odds are he puts up the same numbers Joe Flacco did against some of those deep teams that the Browns played that weren't playing at a high level at that time. It's funny, if it was Deshaun Watson that put up 300 yards against the Jets, if it was Deshaun Watson that put up 300 yards against the Jaguars, we would talk about how the level of competition wasn't great. Oh, he was playing against a team that wasn't playing well, but Joe Flacco does it, and because it surprises us, we don't evaluate those things. But if you want to come here and tell me Joe Flacco played better, that's something we have to evaluate. And you're not going to tell me that he played better because the team was not better with him. Plus 63 with Deshaun Watson on the field in point differential up there with the Kansas City Chiefs. Plus 20 with Joe Flacco. And that's not including the playoff game. If I include the playoff game, it's a negative plus uh, point differential for him when he's on the field. Yeah, you know. Guys like McCoy that are referring to his numbers, it's not figure skating. There's not a judge holding up an eight or a nine. You win, you did enough. You didn't win, you didn't do enough. That that's and ball in your hand in the fourth quarter, go win the game. I've seen him do that a couple of times. So let's see what happens if he can play. Five, eight, 10, 12, hey, 17 games in a row and get into a rhythm. All right, this is from the 33rd team. Um, Those are former NFL executives, highest paid edge rushers in the NFL after Josh Allen's deal, um, which was uh, earlier this week. So Nick Bosa, 34 million, Josh Allen, 30 million, Brian Burns, 28.2 million, TJ Watt, 28 million, Miles Garrett, fifth highest, at $25 million a year. So Allen, uh, Josh Allen agreed to a five-year, $150 million contract, $88 million guaranteed. Now, that same website, a couple of days later, edge rushers who could be next in line for big extensions. And notice who is on that list. Uh, you know, Mike Parsons, they, uh, Hassan Reddick, we'll see. Miles Garrett, yep. Max Crosby, yep. But the thing that this shows you, Again, in, in people that are that uh, don't like Andrew Barry and think I'm, you know, a, a Andrew Barry apologist, he understands the market. When he gave Miles Garrett the contract that he gave him, he had a pretty good idea he was going to be paid like a top five, top ten defensive lineman when he went to renegotiate or or redo the contract. So it was fair to the player. It was fair to the team. And you go and you do it again. Yeah, this is why I always say you don't judge contracts when they're signed. You judge them after they're done. A lot of people had a lot of pain. Oh, $25 million for Miles Garrett. He hasn't won defensive player of the year. You're going to play him this much money. Turns out $25 million for Miles Garrett. That sounds like a bargain to me when you look at Joey, not Joey, Nick Bosa making $10 more million than him. And he's not as good as Miles Garrett. 
and I don't even want to get started on Brian Burns or, or, or Josh Allen. Like, they're not even in the same class as Miles Garrett. Now, I think Miles deserves some credit here. He could have chose to reset the market. He did not choose to reset the market when he was up for his deal in Cleveland. He chose to take a little bit less to stay in Cleveland on that first run. If he doesn't choose to do that, I'm not going to blame him. I mean, he might get north of $36 million. You only get so many times in your life to to get an opportunity like that. So, you know, he's going to probably sign another contract, but knowing how Andrew Barry works it, knowing how the Browns run it as an organization, they're going to find a way to make that contract work for them. Um, this is where the Browns deserve the benefit of the doubt. People talk all they want about the Deshaun Watson contract. It has not stopped the Browns from planning the way that they want to plan. You talk what you want about the Miles Garrett contract turns out to be a bargain. People said a lot about the David and Joku contract when it happened. Turned out to be a bargain now. They're talking about the Jerry Judy one. This is why I tend to give Andrew Barry the benefit of the doubt because as loud as we are about these extensions when they happen three years later we're just as loud praising them for making those extensions at the time they made them quincy carrier from untitled unfiltered browns coverage and i are going to step aside take a quick time out other side of the break we'll head to the voicemail of truth and reason uh, we'll also look at some wide receiver rankings and uh, how one of the top cornerbacks in football disagrees with them sports for sale i'll be right back stay with us Maximum millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier, untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. Let's head to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Well, hello, guys. This is uh, Jim from Rochester again, probably one of your biggest fans. I happen to be listening to uh, Mr. Barry giving interviews all over the place, uh, defending the fact that he had gotten rid of Joe Flacco and kept the second string quarterback that he kept, whose name escapes me. That shows you how fantastic he is. But it seems to me like he's just trying to justify the quarterback he brought in for $250 million guaranteed. But the point of the matter to me is he's trying to keep the pressure off of Deshaun Watson instead of doing the right thing for the team. So in reality, he's not trying to build a team. He's just trying to make himself look like he's right. Um, as always, appreciate all the voicemails. Jim, I'm going to disagree with you here uh, again. Um, so Flacco was 1-8 in, in his time as a starter with the Jets. Now, was it Andrew Berry's outstanding roster? Was it Kevin Stefanski's great play calling that turned him into a really good quarterback? Um, and relative to Flacco, Watson, you don't need to manufacture drama in, a, uh, in an NFL locker room. We've seen enough of it. So, yeah, they want somebody that supports. And I'm not saying Joe Flacco wouldn't. But why would you put something in there that can create the drama that you've spent four years getting away from? I, Quincy, I just I don't understand that. Yeah, I mean... Look, they, they, Joe Flacco, they moved away from the style that Joe Flacco played well in anyways last year. Like, we're just saying this because you like Joe Flacco and you don't like Deshaun Watson. Other than that, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, Andrew Barry, every year, do you realize this, man? Every year, we com we have these complaints about the backup quarterback position, Dave. <laughs> every year, cool, people man. call in yeah. and complain about backup quarterback. Oh, how can we have Jacoby Bursette? He's going to get suspended. We're going to play him. And what do we do by the end of the year? Oh, wow. I love Jacoby Brissett. I can't believe we're not going <laughs> to stick with him. Josh Dobbs? We're going to go with Josh Dobbs as the backup quarterback? Stupid. Andrew Barry should be fired. And then by the end of this year, what were people? Oh, we should have never got rid of Josh Dobbs. We're going to be doing the same thing again. Okay? <laughs> like, Andrew Barry has proven that backup quarterback, he kind of knows what he's doing. And I'm sorry. This is an upgrade. 
Jameis Winston over Joe Flacco, Tyler Huntley over P.J. Walker. If a situation like what happened last year happens, this team is in a better position. And let's also keep it a buck. None of what happened at the end of last year, well, not none. Most of what happened at the end of last year was because your defense was all world. You had an all world defense that allowed you to play with four different quarterbacks that allowed you to beat the San Francisco 49ers with PJ Walker that allowed you to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers with DTR and that allowed you to go on a run with Joe Flacco where he's throwing a bunch of interceptions. It's the defense. It was never really about the backup quarterback. It's the Browns roster. It's the strength that they have there. It's the fact that you could just toss a ball up to David Njoku and he can run with it for 20 yards no matter who is there at the quarterback position. It's that Amari Cooper is going to get open no matter who is there at the quarterback position. We cannot boil down the Browns' success last year to one of the least important parts to it, which was proven to be quarterback because they won games last year, Dave, with four different guys at quarterback. Yeah, and again, I get it. Joe Flacco, it was a great story. Um, I wouldn't bet on a, on a 40-year-old guy who was out until November to repeat what he did um, in those games. It was special. It was fun. I wouldn't count on it. If, if, if I were in the Browns front office and, and my job depended on getting that right, I'm not betting on, on a 40-year-old guy who everybody passed on. I'm just not. No flag will go throw like four interceptions in like five weeks next year, and we're going to be doing the thing again. We're going to be sending the dunk on tweets on all the people who are like, we should have kept Joe Flacco, and then Jameis is going to step in from randomly one day, have a good game. We go, oh, Andrew Barry's incredible. At the, and yeah. He's good at this stuff, man. Like, why? The backup quarterback thing specifically, we have literally done this three years in a row. I don't get why we continue to do this. All right. Uh, this is from Pro Football Network. I think you and I looked at this last Thursday when you were on. So uh, NFL receiver rankings. They go Justin Jefferson 1, Tyree Kill 2, C.D. Lamb 3, Terry McLaurin 14, Calvin Ridley 23, Michael Pittman 24, Tank Dell 25, Chris Olave 26, Amari Ooh. Cooper 27. He's definitely Definitely overrated, and most of the NFL's top cornerbacks aren't scared of him. But the numbers are the numbers. Cooper posted 1,000 yards in five of his last six seasons, including the last two for the Browns. There's some quit in him. But we're also talking about a receiver who racked up 265 yards week 15 with Flacco. Such is the Amari Cooper experience. Okay, so few people would argue one of the top cornerbacks in the NFL, if not the top, is Sauce Gardner. Young guy. Real young guy. Top five wide receivers in the NFL. Adams, Hill, oh, Amari Cooper, Justin Jefferson, and C.D. Lamb. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. Pro Football Network has to do better. I, talk to the cornerbacks. Don't say cornerbacks don't rate. I mean, Sauce Gardner is probably the top rated cornerback in the NFL. And he lists Amari Cooper as one of the top five wide receivers. Genuine piece of advice to anybody out there. Hey, if you don't have a lot to say about all the wide receivers in the NFL, you don't have points that you're willing to make or you're not willing to go in there and dig out and explain why you feel the way that you do, just don't write the article. Just, just don't write the article. In general, if you cannot articulate your point and defend it with something more than platitudes and, and, and just hand gesturing, then you cannot write that article. You should not write that article. Write an article that you actually know something about so you don't come off like this because now I just have a horrible impression of everything that comes from that website because you allowed an article to get written that had things that just objectively weren't true. They also called Amari Cooper a quitter in that article, which was nuts to me because I don't think anybody would describe Amari Cooper like that that's covered Amari Cooper or that's been in a locker room with Amari Cooper. And then let alone just to say the thing about how corners aren't afraid of him. He's one of the best route runners in the NFL. What are you talking about? Core muscle injury two years ago, painful heel injury. And I think he missed one game total. Um, and it was because it was a game that <laughs> they they, they kind of didn't need to get where they were going in the playoffs. So yeah, if you don't know much yeah. about it, you just ain't got to say nothing. Yeah. You ain't got to let us know you don't know. <laughs> you know, that, that's all I, I don't think everybody in the media got to be a genius on everything today that they that, that exists in football. But at least try to know something about what you're writing about. Like, they, you know, that's that's bare minimum, right? That's that's what you have to do to get a C in college. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, I, that one that one got me going, and then when I saw uh, Sauce Gardeners there, I, I I had to do that. Sorry. All right. Um, <laughs> This from your show. Should the Browns worry about the Houston Texans? A lot being made, you know, young quarterback ascending. They go out and they get Stefan Diggs. You, you get Joe Mixon. You add that to, to you know, they already had uh, Tank Dell, Nico Collins, Dalton Schultz. Um, D'Amico Ryan's a, a young and up-and-coming head coach. Texans somebody that the, the Browns need to be concerned about. You know, I, I think that they're a team that could definitely get up there. I look at them and I have some concerns because when you see a team like this that's super young, not just in their leadership, well, not just in their roster, but in their leadership, right? It's led by C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson. And the issue with teams like that is that they're super young. They're, they're led by young guys and they just don't know what's coming up ahead of them there's not a ton of veterans in that locker room and when i say veterans i don't mean guys who's been in the league a lot like veterans like who've been on that team with that organization with that coach for a while like the browns for the first time since coming back in 99 they have veterans on the roster now right when you look at david and joku you think that man's been on this team for eight years he's been with kevin stefanski for four of those eight years right the same thing could be said with nick chubb um the same thing could be said with a lot of guys um on this roster joe batonio almost the entire offensive line like the browns have leadership that's been there for a while that's seen a lot of stuff with this team with this current uh iteration of it so when they do have a bunch of injuries they're able to rally against it when you have young leadership it's really a toss in the air that once adversity hits, how are you going to respond? We saw this with the 2019 Browns, where the Browns had some promise in 2018, thought they made the right hire at the time with Freddie Kitchens, which in retrospect sounds silly. But we were really high on Baker Mayfield at the time. You bring in Odell Beckham. There's a ton of outside hype on the team. And what we saw with that team was that they crumbled under that kind of pressure because it was just too much for them now i don't think they're a perfect mirror for what happened for the 2019 browns but those elements are still at play for this texans team there are still those things that you have to watch out for when you get super excited about a team that just got done being awful a couple a year ago um and a team that doesn't really have a ton of veterans in place because pressure first pipes and they don't have a ton of infrastructure built in Houston yet. So it's a lot of pressure, not a lot of infrastructure on that roster when it comes to leadership. That's where you start to worry about things breaking down or a team having a disappointing year because they can't withhold the kind of pressure that they're going to be standing under. Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns coverage. Now I'm going to step aside, take a quick time out, other side of the break, talk a little bit more about the Browns roster and look at the draft sports for CLE. Be right back. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Try C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Try C students with real world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Try C, where futures begin. We continue talking Browns with Quincy Carrier from Untitled Unfiltered Browns Coverage. All right, Quincy, uh, we heard it a little bit earlier from LaShawn McCoy. Uh, why is the national media still down on slash hating on the Browns? Yeah, I, I think it's just people are used to it. And, like, it's just an easy well to go to. Like, nationally, I think a lot of people, like, agree with the status quo that's out there with the Browns despite the fact that there's empirical evidence that is not true it just is what it is when you spend 20 years kind of being a bad team and being not just bad but kind of hilarious in how you're bad team it, people are, are hesitant to let that go because they don't want to think of new jokes um, but yeah it just is what it is um, the Browns continue to get criticized for things that ultimately they shouldn't be criticized on and eventually people will run into this wall enough to where they would stop doing it because like, we did this with the Jerry Judy contract 
People made a big deal out of it. Ended up being a nothing burger. People did this with Nick Chubb. Oh, he's going to get cut. Ended up being a nothing burger. Uh, people were speculating on whether Kevin Stefanski was going to get fired or not. Ends up being a nothing burger. He's going to get an extension in the offseason. Eventually, people are going to catch up that the Browns are just a good team, and good teams are kind of boring, and they're just going to kind of look somewhere else for what they're looking for. But, you know, right now they're still looking for the Browns, and they're trying to make it happen. And it's just kind of silly to see everybody try to make this team sound dysfunctional after coming off of an 11-win season. Are we being too positive about the Browns? Um, you know, we, <laughs> the roster looks pretty good. So. All right. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, like, if I, I, what fan base wouldn't be excited about a team that was 11-6 and six with 26% of their salary cap? on injured reserve what team would not be excited about a team that has a two-time coach of the year one of the best defensive coordinators in football and just hire one of the better offensive coordinators in football what fan base wouldn't be excited about getting nick chubb back in their lineup what fan base wouldn't be excited about returning for a second year what was a defense we were comparing not to its peers but to its generation who would not be excited about a football team like that, Dave? If I went to your house in 2005 <laughs> and told you the Browns are going to have a team like that with a multiple-time pro bowler at quarterback and one of the best offensive lines in football, the best tight end in football, one of the best running backs in football coming back, one of the most reliable number one receivers in all of football, you just traded for a guy with high upside at number two, you have Elijah Moore there, and then you have a generational defense behind it, I feel like you would have been excited in 2004, right? Am I wrong? No, no. That, yeah, that's. I think everybody would have been. I, I feel so. I don't understand why it would be deemed as too positive to be excited about something that's obvious. Also, you have one of the better GMs and more respected GMs amongst his peers in all of football. This sounds like the stuff that we actually been dreaming for as Browns fans. Hopefully, the results could be the same. But I don't blame anybody for being excited about this team because. Literally, you smack this situation anywhere else and people will understand it. But for whatever reason, people think that it shouldn't happen because it's the Browns. All right. This one from PFF.com. Day two draft fits for all 32 teams. Browns. Junior Colson, linebacker, Michigan, would immediately improve a linebacking group that finished 27th in the NFL and run defense grade last season. Isn't flashy, but fundamentally sound. Missed only five tackles during his final season at Michigan. They, they kind of upgraded with Jordan Hicks, but but okay. Um, do you think the Browns should draft a linebacker, Quincy? I know you've addressed that on on your show. Should they should they draft a linebacker? Start there. When your roster is this deep, anything's on the table as far as who you can draft. Like if if you don't love the tackles there, that's the only position where I'm like, yeah, you probably would be better off, sir, to take one there. Um, so anything's on the board. Junior Colson, I think he does fit what the Browns want to do. And I think that it is important to get Jim Schwartz some guys that he like picked from the ground up to kind of fit his defense the best. Cause right now he's been working with guys who are from other regimes. Now I think JOK is somebody he would have always wanted, but you know, he's been trying to mix and match with guys and pieces that he didn't necessarily pick. So I do think you want to give him uh, a piece and a, a player that he really wants from that linebacker position eventually. If it happens this year, I think it makes sense. But if it doesn't, I also ain't going to complain. All right, also something you addressed on, on your show as well. Who do you think some big-name draft prospects that could fall to the Browns are? Yeah, Tavondre Sweat's definitely one. I mean, he's had one of the worst pre-draft processes we've seen uh, <laughs> and, and been visible to. I mean, it's even worse than what DeWan Jones had last year, and it, he's probably going to be one. He's going to be that guy who falls all the way to day three. Like, you look at the guys who fall a lot, it's usually defensive tackles. He plays defensive tackles, so there's a question of, like, how important is that position anymore, especially, like, not a three-tech. He is more of a nose, kind of a one-two um, kind of player, so... It's already tough for that guy. That guy usually falls. Um, and he hasn't done anything pre-draft that has helped him. He's ultimately a talented player and probably by far the best nose in this draft. So he will be drafted. But he's somebody you can look at and think, okay, he could fall. And if he does fall, the Browns might have interest in the fifth or sixth round with a player like him and with the guy with the questions that he has, especially given that they have a lot of veteran help at that defensive tackle position, which they didn't have with Perrion Winfrey. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Quincy Carrier, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Quincy.
No problem, Dave. You have a great day. Thank you for having me on. Quincy Carrier, make sure you check him out. Untitled, unfiltered Browns coverage. Always really good stuff. Uh, we appreciate his time. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. Jeff Lloyd from the Lockdown Browns podcast. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin. Maximum millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. The Greater Cleveland Sports Hall of Fame celebrates the star athletes and notable sports figures who were born or have made their home in Greater Cleveland. It tells the story of discipline, commitment, perseverance, sportsmanship, and excellence in achievement. It encourages and inspires those who believe in sport and its direct impact on the well-being of our community. Go to ClevelandSportsHall.com or follow us on Twitter at GCLE Sports HOF for more details. We continue talking Browns on Sports for CLE. Let's head back to the voicemail of Truth and Reason. Hi, James Seiler here from Wadsworth, Ohio. Go Brownies! Hey, I was wondering about something. What happened to Perrion Winfrey after the Browns cut him? Did he latch on with another team, or is he out of football now? Thank you very much. You know, with the defensive line coming up in the draft, in all likelihood, defensive tackle, this made me curious. Thank you. Go Brownies! As always, appreciate all of the voicemails. Uh, let's welcome in Jeff Lloyd from the Lockdown Browns podcast. So, Jeff, uh, Perrion Winfrey spent last year on the Jets practice squad, currently a free agent. Uh, Perrion actually saw a little time with the Jets last year, suffered a season ending. They weren't sure, you know, nobody really clarified whether it was an ankle or a foot. Currently a free agent, um, and if you're a big Perrion Winfrey fan, um, he's very active on social media. So if you want to know what Perrion Winfrey is up to, uh, it's not too hard to find. All right, Nick Chubb, uh, contract redone, no surprise. Uh, now the Browns roughly $13 million in cap space. Can you see them adding another free agent probably after the draft? If you think so, what positions do you think uh, Andrew Berry's looking at there? And I think your point is very good as far as after the draft. I mean, you know, with the Browns with only five assets in this draft. Um, and the board, you know, when you start at 54, it may not necessarily always fall into your lap or fall the way you necessarily need it to. You could see interest probably in an offensive tackle. You could see if they're not able to draft another defensive tackle. I think they want to bring in somebody to bring some competition, try to light a fire under Siaki Ika, see if in year two maybe they can get something out of Siaki. Um, those are two positions that I think that would probably be something they would like to maybe, you know, go the veteran route. Certainly tight end would maybe be another one. Um, the Browns are a little shorthanded at the tight end position right now. It's not a great tight end class. The last two years would have been a better opportunity for Cleveland to get into the tight end market. So any one of those three positions is probably something. And it, it might not be necessarily after the draft, but uh, those three positions are certainly uh, rooms that are still a work in progress currently for the Cleveland Browns. When you look at this roster as it currently <clears throat> stands, <clears throat> how do you think it ranks relative to the rest of the NFL? How good is it, if you will? Well, I think a lot of this, when you're doing this, it comes down to you know certainly where you feel the quarterback is, and you're ranking the quarterback of every roster. Um, if you want to eliminate the quarterbacks just for this exercise, um, you know you probably look at running back and you say it's a little bit of a relative unknown due to Nick Chubb, but the offensive line, you think they're going to probably bounce back. They had their worst year collectively in 
2023 since they've been together in 2020. So you think they're going to get better there? The wide receiver room. This could be the best wide receiver room certainly for the Cleveland Browns since you know the Andrew Barry and Kevin Stefanski regime has started. Uh, defensively, you know, you're bringing back almost all of the defensive line. These guys were really good in their first year with Jim Schwartz. I think there, uh, the belief is, and most certainly should be the feeling that that defensive line is going to be vastly improved in year two. Guys will just be more comfortable in the system. Jim Schwartz will be more comfortable with guys as far as their defined roles and what they are capable of. Secondary is stacked. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns don't draft a safety or a cornerback. I just don't, you know, safety, definitely not. Cornerback, you'd probably have to move on from somebody to bring a cornerback in. And with all the talk of the commitment to Greg Newsom and his fifth-year option, you believe that's not an option. But if you wanted to make the argument, you're talking about a top seven, eight roster in the NFL right now. That is absolutely, you know, certainly the case. I think a lot of it depends on where it would rank within those top eight as, you know, what you're going to get from Deshaun Watson, which always seems to be the question that we have as far as what this team will be capable of in 2024. It is your belief of what Deshaun Watson can do, and it's also going to be what Deshaun Watson actually goes out and does. Um, I know you've addressed this on the Lockdown Browns podcast. Takeaways from the free agency when you look – across the AFC North. So the division, which is the best division in football, it was proved, proven uh, last season. What do you think takeaways from, the, from, from free agency? Well, when you look at some of these other teams, they still have starting positions open. Still have starting positions open. The Baltimore Ravens have a couple of offensive linemen openings. The Pittsburgh Steelers, I believe their roster, they have one player who has taken 45 snaps at center. That's it. That's all they have on the entire roster. So it's great you went out and addressed the quarterback, you know, position. But that is obviously a glaring, glaring weakness. You know, Cincinnati, DJ Reader, and was probably one of the best players in the AFC North for the last couple of seasons. You know, his name should certainly deserve to be up there with the Cam Haywards of the division. Um, him getting hurt, him not staying in Cincinnati is a huge, tremendous hole to fill. Um, once he went down last year, you saw all of a sudden that the Bengal linebackers didn't look as good as they had in years past. Just as good as JOK looked last year behind the Browns defensive line when it was good, it was competent. You saw the linebacker emerge. You saw the Bengals linebackers kind of fall behind a little bit when they did not have that great presence in front of them. There is still the whole T. Higgins situation that needs to be worked out. Um, it looks like the Bengals are going to be without their number two and number three wide receiver from 2023. So that'll be you know a transition as guys are going to get a, you know, a larger amount of targets, playing time for the Bengals. The Browns, in my opinion, are the first, probably the only team that right now, if you said, hey, we're suiting it up and you know game one is in 10 days, I don't think you know not having the draft would really affect the Cleveland Browns. For these other teams, it's certainly an issue for these teams. I mean, it is late, late in the ballgame. And we're talking about teams that, you know, two teams that went to the playoffs last year, a team that went to two straight AFC championship games. And here it is two weeks from the draft, and they still have opening positions as far as starters. Jeff Lloyd from the Lockdown Browns podcast. And I'm going to step aside, take a quick time out. Other side of the break, we turn our attention to the draft. Sports for CLE. We'll be right back talking Browns with Jeff Lloyd. Stay with us. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program is dedicated to recognizing exceptional students, teachers, and schools throughout Ohio. Scan the QR code on screen to nominate students and teachers as Academic All-Stars and Teachers of the Month. They must be currently enrolled or teach in grades K-12. Is your K-12 school developing students' literacy skills to achieve success in reading? If so, you can nominate your school for the School of the Year. Students can win $100, teachers can win $500, and schools can win $2,500. Scan the QR code, fill out the forms, and nominate deserving students, teachers, and schools today. The Ohio Lottery Partners in Education program takes pride in honoring exceptional students, teachers, and schools across Ohio. Submit your nomination today. It's fun, fast, and free. Continue talking Browns with Jeff Lloyd from the Locked On Browns podcast. Jeff, I, I know you've talked about this on the Locked On Browns podcast. What do you think the Browns do at 54? When you look at 54, um, what are some things that you, you kind of take into account with the Browns? A lot of this is going to be, look, you got one swing at probably an impact player if you're Cleveland in this draft. So you look at positions where, you know, you can get impact. And what exactly is impact? Impact is people are going to score touchdowns. Impact is people are going to, you know, probably, you know, sack the quarterback. 
So, you know, if you want to look at the running back position here and look, it, it, the Browns are in a difficult spot. Nobody's going to know April 26th when the Browns sit down and make this selection just exactly where Nick Chubb is going to be come week two, week one, week two, week three. There's no way to answer that question. You look at that room and you thought, for me, I think Jerome Ford played a lot better than people are giving him credit for. You know, Dante Foreman, I don't hate the fact that they brought Dante Foreman in, but I think Dante Foreman is a guy that they could replace. They don't have a lot of money guaranteed towards Dante Foreman. Naheem Hines is a player that the way the contract was structured is most likely going to be a part of this team in 2024. So I'm looking running back, and look, they have a chance to probably get, in their opinion, the top running back in this class at 20, at 54. So if that is something that is there, and look, with Nick Chubb, and the way the contract is now done now, we know he will be here in 2024. We'll see how 2024 goes. Who knows? Maybe the Browns are going to feel that Nick Chubb, and they were always trying to do this, they were always trying to keep that you know touch number low. Is this something that they're going to believe is going to be the case going further? So that might mean when they go to renegotiate Nick Chubb for further from 2024, maybe Nick in his camp is going to say, hey, we think we can still do a little bit more of a heavier workload, which in turn means that maybe we think we deserve a little bit more money or we would like a little bit more money. Or you look at defensive tackle. You know, Jim Schwartz is just going to continue to attack, 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 attack. He's going to, in every nickel and dime situation, he's going to get the four freshest pass rushers he can on the field. You look at a player like Mike Hall, matches every criteria the Browns look for. The athleticism was really good. The age certainly lines up with what the Browns are looking for. He can get after the quarterback. He can rush the passer. I feel Mike Hall could probably play some base D end in nickel and dime situations, just continuing the you know maneuverability, the flexibility that Jim Schwartz can do with his defensive line. Alex Wright can play inside. Alex Wright can play outside. We know Miles can play area everywhere. So Darius Smith played some inside, certainly played some outside. Just one more guy that you could come in there and just give you that continuous. The Browns' top four defensive tackles this season are going to be 29, 30, 31, and 32. You have Ika. We don't know necessarily what we have there yet. A player like Mike Hall could come in, and you're saying maybe it's, what, 7, 8, 12 reps per week. You get an athlete like that, you're telling him go all out on every one of those reps he takes. You could get some pretty significant return. And then start having to, you know, starting to have the ability where that room is starting to be built for 2025 and further. All right. So this is from Pro Football Focus, PFF.com. Predicting the biggest surprises in the 2024 NFL draft. No running back drafted until the third round. This has always been viewed as a weak running back class with no top prospects. And the way contracts were being doled out to veterans suggest even that analysis may not have been strong enough. Um, it kind of goes with what you were saying. It, it, they, the Browns could draft in the third round and get one of their top two or three. At some point, late second, early third, fourth round, there's going to be a bunch of these guys, running backs, in this class taken. And there are still – there are none that are studs, but there's a lot of them that are going to play five, six years in the NFL. There's a couple of thoughts here. Now, you know, you sit down and you talk to a lot of people, you listen to a lot of people high up in the draft circles talk about this running back class, and it doesn't seem there is a consensus number one running back. That certainly is going to lower the position overall. Plus, you know, as we get closer and closer to the draft, you start to get to see guys do articles of, you know, what would be the perfect, you know, making of a running back from this class. So-and-so stiff arms, so-and-so's 40 times, so-and-so's wiggle. So it just shows you the diversity and you're not admit, you know, the feeling that maybe everyone believes that there's some guys that truly aren't just full time backs. The days of full time backs, I'm not saying it's numbered, but it is rarefied air that you can just say this is a guy you pencil him in 300 carries. He can catch 60 passes. First off, teams don't want to get that heavily invested into a running back in a situation like that, because the problem is if you lose them. Then you're in some serious, serious trouble because you did not develop any other guys. You didn't give anybody else, you know, reps to keep them fresh, kept reps to keep them, you know, focused as to what every responsibility they may have within your offensive system. So it could go that way. I think this running back class is a little bit better than people are giving it credit for. Is it a deep class? No. Is it top heavy? No. But there is some good bang for the buck. I mean, you got guys who contributed in the receiving aspect. You got guys that contributed as runners. You know, there's guys who, you know, even running back by committee is even a thing in college now. So some of these guys, you know, the stats are deflated and you can't necessarily hold that against them. You could only do what you do with the amount of times you have the ball in your hands. You can't call your own plays. And, you know, when you're promising, you know, blue chip 
you know, high school seniors that if you come to my school, you're going to get to play. It does hurt some of the draft stock of the guys currently in the room. But the caveat to that is, is you are getting to the NFL with fresher legs. You've taken less hits, you know, less wear and tear on the tires. Um, so it's just, it, it's an ebb and flow, you know, but overall, I don't think, you know, running back is something that any NFL team truly wants to maybe even be drafting top 10, let alone round one. There are special circumstances, a player like Bijan Robinson, of course. All right. Um, this from CBSSports.com. It is a seven round mock draft. Chris Trapasso did uh, the Browns at 54. They have the Browns taking Trey Benson running back from Florida State. We'll also look at the third round pick at 85. They have him coming back and taking an offensive lineman, Dominic Pooney uh, from Kansas. So we talked about the um, the running back a, a little bit earlier in the segment. If it is in fact Trey Benson that's staring them at 54, you think they take him? Uh, I, I would I would run the card in a heartbeat. Um, I think you have a future there with a player like Trey Benson, and I don't think it affects anything as far as what your plans are for Nick Chubb. It gives you you know assurances that you have a second top back. You know, at a second round pick, you're not paying him a boatload of money. Um, Trey Benson, I, I would say, is a player with sneaky long speed. You know, I am a Florida State fan. I have watched a ton of Trey, ben Trey Benson over the last two years. I figured he was a guy who probably ran about four or five flat. Uh, when he broke 4-4 four, four at the combine, it definitely surprised me. Um, I think he gets a little bit stronger as the game goes on. So when he's getting that 14, 15, 16 carry, he's able to, you know, to, you know delve out punishment. Uh, you know, take those runs that should be five, six yards, get them to seven or eight, the yards that are oh so crucial late in the ballgame to close it out. Trey Benson would you know be, uh, for me, an absolute no-brainer. And if you're telling me it was Trey Benson competing against Dante Foreman, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, and, you know, running backs and the ebbs and flows and the injuries, you know, Dante Foreman could be somebody that I could just move somewhere in August, you know, or right around the cut-down lane as somebody's maybe looking for a veteran back or, you know, they lost some running backs due to injury. Yeah, the other thing is I could absolutely see them taking an offensive lineman. You you know, I, you got Teller and, and Batonio. None of them are getting any younger. Same thing with Posick. Your your two tackles are older as well. You do have Dewan Jones, but you got a lot of money invested in that offensive line. The line is always going to be something that they <laughs> value. So I could certainly see them taking a lineman third, fourth round. Well, the other thing is, is you have a brand new offensive line coach. So, you know, this offensive line coach is not necessarily married to that room the way it is currently structured. So with that being, you know, there are guys, um, you know, Blake Fisher out of Notre Dame is just a mean old cuss, a really, really strong player. Roger Rosengarten out of uh, Washington, really, really, really strong player as well. And I think this is something where the board is probably going to line up and the Browns are going to say, look, we're going to do it. I don't even know how much time maybe, the, you know, ideally Jack Conklin, Dewan Jones, and maybe even Judge Wells take every rep in 2024. But I do have to start thinking about the future of that room. And I do think you hit the nail on the head is you start to have to think about the finances of that room. Um, the room is very, very expensive as it is. Um, not one guy, oh, the only guy besides, Je you know, Jedrick Wills, who's slated to start right now, is not on a second contract, but he's actually on a fifth-year option, which certainly is a very, very healthy amount of money. It is something where the Browns, you know, need to maybe get younger, perhaps a little bit more athletic. And it's not knocking the guys that are there. It's just that, you know, a certain age, you know, your athleticism starts to dwindle a little bit. They're still really, really good players. But you would like to get that room younger, more athletic, and like you said, Dave, most certainly a little bit more less expensive. Jeff Lloyd from the Lockdown Browns podcast, as always. Great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Jeff. All the best, Dave. Always a blast. Two weeks away, folks. Absolutely. Can't, can't wait. Draft coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, make sure you check out the Lockdown Browns podcast, Jeff. Always good stuff um, with that as far as Browns coverage goes. We're going to step aside, take a quick time out. We turn our attention to the Cavaliers. Chris Fedor from Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealers. Straight ahead. Stay with us. Come back to go forward. Back to learning new things. Back to pursuing your dreams. Tri-C has flexible learning options to fit your life. And every year, more than 1,000 local companies provide Tri-C students with real-world learning. The right education can boost your lifetime earning power by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Start now with a college education you can afford. Tri-C, where futures begin.
Play Maximum Millions and $2 million ultimate cash from the Ohio Lottery. And you may never look at scratch-offs the same way again. I am powerful beyond my wildest imagination. I will define my future. I will keep challenging myself to improve. Because I am a future leader of this great nation. I will be responsible for raising a beautiful family. And educating not only my generation, but many more to come. I will make a difference in my community. And I will stand up for what I believe in. I will not settle for simply chasing my dreams. I will achieve them. Because I was given a chance. An opportunity. A home. At Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America. The ultimate leadership experience. FCCLA has been one of the greatest experiences of my life. It's made me who I am today. Join us. We'll build a new future together. We turn our attention to the Cavaliers. Cavs, uh, two games left in the regular season, both at home against Indiana and Charlotte. If they win those two games, uh, they will have home court advantage in the first round of the playoffs. Uh, Cavs improved to 47 and 33. They had a 12 point win over Memphis. Uh, stayed perfect 14 and 0 when they hold teams to under 100 points. Uh, Chris tweeted this out, Chris Fedor. Donovan Mitchell looked more like himself. Mitchell, 29 points, 9 of 17 from the field, 5 of 10 from behind the arc, also 8 assists. Let's welcome in Chris Fedor, Cavs beat reporter for the Plain Dealer, Cleveland.com. What did you f see from Donovan Mitchell um, against the Grizzlies? Just that, Dave, that he looked more like himself, um, more like the, the, the pre-All-Star break Donovan Mitchell, who was – one of the best players in the NBA. He was an Easter Conference All-Star. He was in the MVP conversation. And you just saw him being able to move a little bit better on the court. He could get to his spots a little bit easier. He was able to get past his initial defender. The stop-start was there. The change of direction was there. He's not back-back. One game doesn't make him back-back. But it showed signs that potentially with more rest, potentially with more... Uh, reps potentially with more time on the court to build confidence and figure out what his knee will allow him to do what it won't allow him to do there's a belief now that he is making progress and by the time that the playoffs roll around he may be closer to full strength and it just didn't feel like that during the recent west coast road trip he felt like he was dragging his leg he felt like his explosiveness wasn't there so the fact that that stuff was visible last night against Memphis, no matter the opponent, that's a good sign for the Cavs, and that's a good sign for Donovan. So I, I know you wrote an article just kind of, you know, the, the reason for the struggles. Is it as simple as, as Donovan Mitchell hasn't been able to, to play like Donovan Mitchell, for lack of a better description? I think so. The analogy that I made was the Philadelphia 76ers, right, because – at one point during the season, they were a legitimate title contender in the Eastern Conference. They were the third best team in the East in terms of record. And then all of a sudden, Joel Embiid goes out with a meniscus injury, and they plummet down the standings to eighth. Now they're in seventh. But that is a big, big drop. And nobody was asking themselves, hey, why did Philadelphia fall all the way to number seven? Because it was obvious, right? Joel Embiid's not on the court. Philadelphia is not going to function the same way offensively and defensively. They're going to be a completely different team without Joel Embiid, and they're going to struggle to consistently win games. They're 15-27 and 27 so far this year without Joel Embiid. They were 11-18 and 18 during the most recent stretch when he was recovering from the meniscus injury. But that didn't mean that Nick Nurse was a bad coach. That didn't mean that Philadelphia was no longer a title contender. That didn't mean that Tyrese Maxey couldn't step up and fill the void of Joel Embiid. It just means when you're playing without an MVP candidate, it's going to cripple your chances of consistently winning basketball games. So all I'm saying is, if that's the obvious reason and everybody can accept the fact that Philly tumbled from three down to eight, now to seven, because Joel Embiid, their MVP candidate, wasn't out there to help them consistently win those games, why can't people say the same thing about the Cavs and Donovan Mitchell? They're 12 and 14 without him, Dave. When he's on the court, they play to the level of the number one seeded Western Conference Minnesota Timberwolves. That's what the numbers say. When he's off the court, 
the Cavs play to the level of the Chicago Bulls, who are a play-in team in the Eastern Conference. That's a drastic difference. And yeah, there are other things that you can point to, other flaws that the Cavs have in terms of their roster construction. But when Donovan Mitchell is out there and playing well, they're a great team. When Donovan Mitchell is not healthy or unavailable, they're not a good team. And I do think it's pretty simple <laughs> if people just are willing to accept that reality. Yeah, you know, you, you, usually the simplest answer is the correct one. I mean, the, 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 stop making sense. All right, um, let me ask you this. Do you have any idea what to expect from the Cavaliers in the playoffs? I don't because I don't know how healthy Donovan is going to be, and I don't know how effective he's going to be. And I think those are two different things, right? I think he's healthy enough to play. Clearly, it's not something that is structurally wrong with his knee. It's not something that he believes playing on it is going to re-injure it or make it worse. But there's a difference between being healthy enough to play and being healthy enough to be effective while playing, especially in the playoff crucible. I mean, I don't know who they're going to play. It could be Indiana. It could be Orlando. It could be New York. It could be Miami. It could be Philadelphia. There is no cakewalk waiting for the Cavs in the first round of the playoffs. So we're talking about um, high-level basketball, pressure-packed basketball, um, a lot of stress on that knee, and it's just hard for me to gauge how effective Donovan is going to be when the playoffs roll around. If, if I continue to see more evidence of the old Donovan Mitchell the way that we did last night against the Memphis Grizzlies, then maybe my viewpoint is going to change a little bit. Um, but Donovan is the one who's going to have to carry this offense. Donovan is the one who the defense is going to focus their attention on. Donovan is the one who's capable of dictating terms and shifting a series. And if he's not the guy that he was at the beginning of the season, when the Cavs were 36 and 17 and he was in the MVP conversation, it's going to be hard for them to win um, four out of those seven games against any of the opponents that are waiting for them in the first round because those are going to be pretty much close to toss-up series to begin with, Dave. So I do think it's hard to gauge just, just one, how good this team is, two, how ready this team is, because you just don't know the level of readiness of Donovan when it comes to playoff basketball with his knee. So let me ask you this. The, 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 in theory, the, when I see Struess, Nyang, Morris, and even Tristan Thompson, when I see them play, I'm like, all right, now let me, these are the guys that can help you win playoff series. Is that, is that, those are guys you just don't, it's like gum scraping if they're going to defend you and play physical with you. You're going to know that they're there. The thing, Dave, it's so funny that you bring this up because in the aftermath of the Knicks series, all anybody inside the organization wanted to say was, no, we were tough enough. We were physical enough. We just got outplayed. We got outcoached, however they wanted to phrase it, right? But they pushed back against this notion that the Cavs were bullied by the New York Knicks, that the Knicks were more physical than them. And then they spent every single, every single dollar that they spent since that moment was to bring in guys with playoff experience, playoff toughness, and all guys who play with an edge to them. So all I'm saying is um, their moves, <laughs> their moves don't back up the things that they were saying in the aftermath of that Knicks series. George Niang's been there, done that. He understands what playoff basketball is all about. He understands what it takes. Same thing when it comes to Max Drew. Same thing when it comes to Tristan Thompson, Marcus Morris Sr. as well. And George Niang and Max Struess are among the league leaders in technical fouls because they play with that toughness. They play with that edginess. They're willing to mix it up. They're not going to get pushed around the same kind of way. Now, are those guys going to make shots? Are they going to be talented enough to get consistent minutes in the playoffs? We'll just have to wait and see how, how the matchups present themselves and what the Cavs need on a nightly basis. But having that playoff know-how and that experience on the sidelines, I think that is going to help the Cavs in a way that they were missing it last year against the Knicks. Before I let you go, um, do they have to, for the organization to feel pretty good about it, do they have to win at least one playoff series here for them to feel good about oh, this yeah. year? 
Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's the thing. Everybody knew coming into this year, Dave, um, that their final judgment was going to come in the playoffs. Um, whether this season was going to be a success or failure was going to come in the playoffs. Because they already showed that they could be a regular season team. They already showed that they could take the step necessary as an organization in the regular season. Um, last year, they won 51 games. They boosted their win total by seven. They went from play in tournament to playoffs, home court advantage. Now, the next step for this organization is getting out of the first round of the playoffs and not having a duplicate performance of what happened last year against the New York Knicks. And yeah, they've dealt with some things throughout the course of this year. Their starting lineup has played less than 400 total minutes together. Guys have been in and out of the lineup because of injuries. They're probably not going to be at full strength going into the playoffs. So there are things that um, obviously could complicate their ability to win a playoff series, but that's where judgment is going to come. It's going to be about how much did J.B. Bickerstaff learn from getting out coached by Tom Thibodeau last year against the Knicks? How much of a better coach is he going into these playoffs? Is that going to show itself? Is Darius Garland going to have more readiness for what the playoffs require? Same thing when it comes to Evan Mobley, Isaac Okoro, and some of these other guys. And I'll say this, taking it an uh, in even step further, like when it comes to the future of Donovan Mitchell, forget like the other moves that the Cavs could make if they were to lose a first round playoff series again, just like last year, that changes the dynamic, that changes the status quo when it comes to Donovan's feeling on this organization. It would be a lot harder for him to commit long-term and sign an extension if the team was coming off back-to-back -back first round early exits in the playoffs. So it is critical to this organization to win at least one playoff series and maybe even be competitive in the second one that they would face. Chris Fedor, as always, great stuff. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks very much, Chris. You got it, Dave. Anytime, man. Chris Fedor, make sure you check him out. Great Cavs coverage for the Plain Dealer as well as Cleveland.com. Uh, make sure you follow him. He'll have everything leading up to and through the playoffs with the Cavs. It's going to do it for this edition of Sports for CLE. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Have a great night, everybody. See you tomorrow at 4 on Sports for CLE.